Perfect. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, very well. Perfect. Okay, so uh, let me start with a short introduction uh, about us. So Imina Technologies is a Swiss company founded in Lausanne in 2009. And uh, since then, we've been uh, providing robotic solutions for light and electron microscopes. And um, most recently, we actually started working with AFMs as well, which is pretty interesting. Um, and these systems are used for um, mostly electrical probing, so running IV curves, um, transistor characterization, um, of course, semiconductor failure analysis, which involves a few techniques I will talk about later, and um, the manipulation or characterization of all kinds of sample. Um, we work together uh, with Point Electronic uh, regarding the electrical failure analysis in SEM, which I will focus on today. Um, and I will also give a short outlook on the uh, nanoprobing and AFM uh, capabilities together. So together with Point Electronic, we uh, provide uh, fully integrated solutions um, that includes the probers and all the electronics necessary for the techniques. The techniques are, you've probably heard of them, uh, EBAC, eBirch, and eBIC mostly. Of course, there are others, but I will focus on these three today. Um, short introduction for some of you who are not familiar with the techniques. Um, so start with RCI is a technique that maps resistances, uh, the resistance in the device. Um, it has two probes and uh, there's a high probe and a low probe. And uh, whenever your electron beam shines on your device and hits a location, that is um, connected to your uh, high probe, or actually the shortest path would be to your high probe, the electrons will be absorbed and collected to your high probe, which will give rise to a bright image. When um, the shortest path is to the low probe or the ground probe, uh, this will give a dark uh, image. So this is mostly used for um, open and short um, characterizations of, uh, of samples. And here is a case study where uh, we had to find um, a short uh, between two uh, metal layers. On the left here, you see a functioning device, which uh, shows only one metal track lighting up on the RCI signal. And on the right, a failing device where the same metal track is lighting up, but we'll see a whole other network on top of it. So there's obviously a short in between these two and uh, they're crossing each other at four different locations. So four locations to investigate. Um, for that, we tilted the probing platform, landed the probes on the device, and we used the fib to um, cut uh, the metal lines close to each of the crossing points. And we were looking at if the crossing point is still uh, lighting up. So is in the case here. And that means that the short is located uh, right here. So on the top here, you see uh, the full metal line, then the fib cut, and here the, um, the, the metal line is still lighting up. Uh, so that means the short is here. So um, that was actually very useful uh, to be able to run the whole experiment while being in tilted position. So we don't have to bring the probing station back and forth from uh, flat to tilted. So all the signals landing and et cetera were done tilted, which increases the, the speed greatly. Um, second technique is a e uh, which is a technique that image the local weaknesses in devices. And uh, for this technique, we land two probes. We pass a current in between the two. The amount de depends on the, the application mostly. And uh, from there, when you shine with your electron beam on your device, whenever the beam hits a location that makes the resistance uh, in between the two probe change, the spot here, um, the location will appear as a bright spot. So that means the electron beam is able to change the resistance uh, in between the probes when it hits this location and the rest remains black. So um, we have a case study here where um, we had to localize uh, defects in a gate oxide of a transistor. And so for that, we landed um, 
probe on the gates, another on the bulk, and we recorded an IV curve um, of the defect induced leakages um, in this case. So um, we selected a low current here to apply between the two probes of around 300 nanoamps. And this is mostly to not further damage your sample. If there's already a defect and you try to apply a high current uh, through it, you might uh, add other defects or other things you don't want to happen. Um, and we were able to get this nice eBirch image, which pinpoints the location of the of the failure here. And um, so first, um, we were able to to detect that even though we had a very small current passing through the probes. And secondly, which something which was interesting is the results were actually pretty similar, no matter which uh, beam current we chose, or were actually not so dependent on the beam current which um, suggests that the mechanism behind eBirch is not heat related like for Oberch, for example. Um, so with 86 picoamps, it's unlikely the sample's heating up. So it must be another type of interaction such as uh, generation of electron hole pairs and uh, things like that. So pretty interesting results as well. Um, the last one to the family is eBIC um, and this one image uh, electric fields in your device uh, and mostly PN junctions as they are uh, they have internal electric fields. So how does that one work? Uh, you shine your electron beam on your device and whenever it hits a PN junction you generate electron and hole pairs and uh, with the built-in electric fields you're able to separate them. So some charges will go to the high probe here will be collected and uh, will show a bright area on your, um, on your image. So that's a way to see PN junctions. And um, case study here was um, a sample that was um, suspected to have abnormal doping profiles. So it was cross-sectioned, mounted on this holder and probed on the side to, uh, to see if the shape of the of the doping profile was as expected or if there were defects or the shape was not um, as it was supposed to be. So um, with that, I think I've run through the three uh, main techniques and we actually learned a few things uh, while doing these experiments. Um, the first one is that when you do a FA job, uh, you often require more than one technique. You cannot focus on just RCI, EBIC, or, or one of them, you either because you're going blind on your sample, you don't know uh, where the location is, and you first need to do a RCI, for example, to find a location, and then eBirch to find a spot, or you're doing EBIC first on your transistor, and once you found the, the right spot, you want to do IV curve on your transistor. So you really need to be able to switch between these techniques in a very smooth and safe way as well for the for the probes and sample. So we realized that it was really a key for uh, for success here. The um, second thing is um, there are wide range of failures in the in samples and you really need a uh, high sensitivity of the electronics and by that I mean in situ preamplification of the current if you want to um, see the smallest um, resistance change for example or the smallest resistance in between the two, the two probes. So that's very critical if you want to be sure to not miss even the smallest defects uh, out there. Uh, we found out as well that uh, it is necessary to have access to all your signals together. By that, I mean the SEM, the RCI or EBIC signal and the overlay of both of them. And you need to have that live and being able to navigate on your sample as you want to be sure that there's no other locations lighting up on your sample that you did not expect, or to just adjust the parameters of your electronics to get the best image. And finally, of course, a reliable probing system as your probe will stay for quite some time on the contacts uh, before you get the final image. And talking about image, of course, good SCM conditions are necessary. Uh, now a short outlook. Uh, so we started working more and more with uh, AFMs recently as um, 
by that, I mean mounting nanoprobers on the AFM scanner itself so that uh, they can be combined with uh, other like AFM uh, EFA techniques, such as the ones we talked about today quite a bit already. And um, the growing demand we got for, um, for this combination is uh, because people want to power their device up uh, while um, doing all these techniques. Um, and of course, that allows you to see defects that are only there when your device is powered up or to localize or to find soft failures, uh, all kinds of stuff um, that really need your uh, external power or external signal to your device as well. Uh, there's other applications, let's say you're for conductive AFM, if you're, the backside of your sample is not conductive, or you want to run conductive AFM only uh, between specific nets, um, the probers can also uh, provide that. And finally, it gives a more um, full or complete system uh, because you're able to uh, do some kind of failure analysis with the probers, meaning localizing a cell uh, that is failing uh, prior to AFM measurements so that you know where to look. Uh, so overall, it's a more complete system. But it comes with challenges, of course. So they need to be small. They need to uh, not interfere with the tip and detection laser. And small being uh, uh, necessary, light is also necessary to not uh, change the scanner properties. Um, so all that is necessary in order to, to combine the two. And uh, we had a few installations already. Uh, you see on the left, a prober on an AFM scanner. And on the right, it's an ongoing project where we uh, plan to put four of them on the scanner. Um, and we recently had a project with um, a Park NX20, a pretty good AFM for failure analysis. And I was hoping to get images and data uh, by today, but uh, installation got delayed. So uh, we're still working on that, but we're very excited to work with AFMs now and um, are starting to work with them. And if you have other um, applications or measurement techniques that you think would be useful with probers, uh, we're really interested. And with that, that'll be the end of my talk. Um, thanks a lot. All right, thank you so much, William. Um, so, oh, that was my timer. So perfect in time. Um, okay, so I'm giving over to, to Matthew. And just for your information, now you can chat with everyone. Sorry for that, the function was blocked. All right, Matthew. So we had one question. I'm not sure if it was for this talk or the last talk. Um, Alok Ranjan, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it was for the last talk actually, uh, because I was quite interested in the probes, like uh, for the eight probe system, like the Hyper Hyperion 2, like where we have eight probes in the AFM. Like, do we have trials of the probes that we can put, or is it like a proprietary probe, the materials and all those? Uh, the thickness constants. So I cannot answer that question <laughs> since yeah, I, I might be able to, and Jean Philippe maybe can do it better because I worked with uh, AFM uh, nano probers for a while. At least when I was using them, um, the probes were full tungsten metal. So okay, there's okay. a like a stainless steel cantilever that's bent because obviously to get eight AFM tips in a very small area, we can't use traditional AFM where you have a laser coming straight down vertically. They're side fire lasers um, that go out onto a bent lever, and then you you mount a um, a tungsten probe onto that. Um, there may have been some advancements uh, since then, but we're having a, another uh, chat room after this as well, Justina. So maybe we can have that answer. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. So are there any other questions for um, William? Otherwise, I will ask um, one, because I was interested, obviously, in your integration into the AFM uh, mm -hmm. systems. So you're using solely the optics from the AFM um, to place the, the probers yeah. onto the sample? Yeah, so that's a limitation. You, you, you need the resolution of your optics to be good enough. But um, Actually, what the probers are used for is not really, I mean, the, the last part of the, I don't know, conductive EFM or spreading uh, resistant microscopy is, of course, done by the, by the AFM. The probes yeah. here are more used to either power the device up or um, do some more um, top layer investigation or to find the location where you would want to, to scan next. And, of course, if you're um, 
if you're um, investigating uh, top layers that are, I don't know, one micron or so large that you can see uh, with the microscope, you can for sure also uh, probe directly as long as you can see. But of course, that's a limitation, yeah. Obviously, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the same probe, have to be in the same field of view because you can you can move the stage in between to place your probes and then go to your measurement area, I guess. Sorry, I did not understand your question. Um, so do all the probes have to be in the same field of view or you can move the stage between the, the placement different areas? I don't know if you have fib pads or other things you're trying to connect to. You can you can definitely move, uh, move the whole uh, stage and land probes one by one, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be in the same field of view. Okay. Um, we have another question for you from our first speaker again, Thomas Hanschel. So Thomas, if you want to go ahead and ask. Hello, yeah. Thanks, William, for the overview. Uh, a question, maybe I misunderstood it, but um, can you also scan with your units themselves? If not, can you mount the scanner on your tip, let's say, in order to enable scanning? Yeah, so the, the robots themselves have, uh, let's say, you can use the, the piezo to, to scan in a certain area. They don't have uh, feedback, so you, you, you won't know how much... Um, how close or um, how much force you apply in your sample. So I would not recommend to use them as a as an AFM, but we had people mounting AFM tips on them. Um, uh, so this can be done, yeah. So with uncontrolled scanning, that could be enabled. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. No problem.